So recording is on. Um, welcome everybody. Today is uh, 2nd November 2020. This is um, the plenary, the Young Scholar Initiative plenary warm-up session. And today we're having an introduction to the liquidity project financial market infrastructure, to CCP clearing houses, and to the money view. And in order to introduce our speakers, I am going to take my notes for that. Uh, so please just bear a minute uh, with me on this. So we have with us today um, Cecilia uh, Ossesi. Um, she is um, uh, she's the outgoing uh, YSI Finance Law and Economics Working Group Coordinator and a current member of the European Banking Institute's Young Research Group. She has recently completed her PhD in banking supervision at the School of International Studies um, in Trento. Cecilia has a legal background and her doctoral dissertation lies at the interface of financial regulation, social sciences and regulatory studies. She's currently a graduate program participant at the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, Europe her research interests include banking and financial regulation, financial digitization and datafication, central banking, international and EU political economy. Her motivation in the liquidity project financial market infrastructure is to better understand the needs and specificities of modern finance and contribute to bridging the gap between the academic and policy world. So welcome, Ceci. We also have um, Christoph um, on, on the line. And Christoph studied mathematics at the University of Trier in, uh, in Europe and received his doctorate in financial mathematics from the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. After completing his doctorate, he worked at the Frankfurt School as a lecturer and then as a risk manager at Commerzbank, a European bank. Uh, Christoph has been professor for uh, financial mathematics and stochastics at Darmstadt University of Applied Science since 2015. His research interests are financial stability, particularly the stability of the shadow banking system and financial market economic, econometrics. His uh, motivation to join the liquidity project financial market infrastructure lie in quantifying liquidity um, uh, problems um, through the money view in within the LPFMI project. Real quick about myself, um, everyone calls me Kiko, um, uh, otherwise Gerhard, and I am a, my highest degree is a, a master um, degree in, um, in economics um, at Northwestern University, um, Land School of Economics, uh, Leipzig Graduate School of Management and Tsinghua University. Um, and uh, my research interests lie specifically within the liquidity project, financial market infrastructure, and um, with a special focus on payment systems, um, specifically F foreign exchange uh, payment systems. And my motivation is I'm going to be heading for economic policy at some point in my life in the, in the developing world. And, I, and uh, the financial system and the role of a financial system uh, in this is, is, is gonna be my, my, my piece and this project allows me to have a starting point. Adam, we haven't introduced you. You wanna do this quickly? Sure, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm delighted to attend this session. My name is Adam. I'm a coordinator of the uh, Financial Stability Working Group uh, together with uh, uh, Natalia and Nicole, and uh, we are looking forward to this very interesting session. Thank you, Kiko. Thank you, Adam. I should have introduced you before I introduced myself, and I just realized when I introduced the three that I should have taken you before that. But you're also uh, very active in LPFMI, and so um, thank you for making this possible. Okay, what we're going to do now um, is I'm going to quickly um, start with a liquidity project financial market infrastructure introduction to get everyone um, the message of what we do. And then some two core uh, aspects of this is going to be CCP clearinghouses 
and uh, the money view, and that we'll do in this order and do Q and A at the end. So um, I'm sharing my my screen now. That's just the wrong slide to start with. So real quick, everybody, um, you'll see on this page, on the left hand side, just to frame it, we're within obviously or not within the financial system, and with the goal of financial stability, this uh, project LPFMI is concerning itself with liquidity questions in financial market infrastructure. I come to that. We'll come to that. What that? What? How is that? what one uh, definition of that is. And therefore, we're open to the following questions. One, liquidity problems at FMIs. This is the core of this project. Do uh, uh, approach us if, number two, you're interested in liquidity problems uh, somewhere else in the financial system. So this could be, for example, banks. So this could be the liquidity project banks, and we could be the starting platform or, um, or provide help of any sorts if that's something you want to do. And then last but not least, there is uh, any kind of problems around financial market infrastructure in itself. Uh, here, mostly we are by design interested in innovation like blockchain and distributed ledger technology. You'll see here in the middle, a classical um, definition of what financial market infrastructure or FMI means. So this could be an exchange, this could be clearing and settling institutions, trade data repositories, custodians repositories, and the payment system. Um, if that doesn't mean a lot to you, um, don't worry. There's gonna, there's, uh, we're gonna dig into some of them or have duck into some of them. And there's um, so webinars that you can sort of tap for that. But if you think of brands, companies, corporations out there, you can think of the New York Stock Exchange, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Deutsche Börse, or the London Stock Exchange. Um, th these large corporations would offer some, if not all of um, these uh, FMI constituents. So um, what have we done already? Uh, we are sort of since 2018, 2019 on the road. Uh, it's more or less a, a small circle of around 15 to 25 active members. Um, and, and the very active ones are probably, is probably even smaller, but I would say um, that's probably a good number. And the core focus, uh, the starting point of has been a money view project. I come to it in a moment, uh, but there's now more interaction with uh, the law. Uh, there's a specific interest for some of us in custodians, um, again, others with blockchain uh, and others again with economic development. So we had a fall curriculum, uh, which is right in the middle, it's coming to its end actually, uh, but there's uh, recordings if you're interested we had interaction with economic innovation, you know, think blockchain. Um, and we had someone um, of SESI from the ECB uh, talking to us about oversight in that segment. We had just uh, yes, uh, last week on Thursday, we had um, Professor Dan Ori from Cornell Law School with us um, and continuing a conversation with him who is an expert in so, sort of theory and derivatives markets and but with this strong interaction with financial market infrastructure. We're going to have um, tomorrow um, actually a, a conversation with someone from the World Bank uh, on economic development. What role do CCPs as a, a constituent of financial market infrastructure play with developing countries? Uh, and then there's going to be some events at, at the plenary. So I would recommend those of you who are interested in this uh, on November 10, there's going to be a panel discussion with um, Robert Steigerwald from the Chicago Federal Reserve Bank um, with Dan Ori from, um, from Cornell Law School with Perry Merling from Boston University um, about this issue of um, financial market infrastructure, derivatives, financial market infrastructure, and, and sort of a subsector of that with CCPs. Uh, that's definitely something um, if you want to have a high level entry entry into this topic to just have a peek. And there's going to be as well a um, presentation session of, for those of you who are more advanced, um, um, about three sc scholars who are affiliated with this program on their current research. So PhD candidates, like just most of you uh, are at the moment. And I think that session is, was that on the 13th, Adam? I think so. Yeah. So that would be uh, November 13. Yes. Those of you with a legal interest, uh, we're going to have on uh, Wednesday, 
um, on uncleared margining um, a, a legal a, a lawyer in, in there. But it's going to be it's, that's a subsector of a subsector. It's very interesting, but if you're not familiar with that, that's probably going to be very very detailed for you. But those of you who are um, already in the in the in the in the topic, we're going to have uh, as you can see here on the fourth um, this um, topic. Yeah. So. Moving on quickly, there's some um, former revenue, uh, former webinars. There is um, a whole um, um, ecosystem that we have, we're trying to build. This is all about a community, LPFMI. At its core, is also about having fun and it's, it's creating a community. Some of you will come and some of you will go. Uh, that's not the issue, but um, it's, it's built to have sort of this communal aspect. And so these people are all people who have met us several times and are probably gonna stay um, associated with this research um, focus, even though you might go uh, and you might come back again. And these are, you know, institutions like the Federal Reserve Bank, the European Central Bank, um, the International Monetary Fund, uh, of course, here at the center, universities um, with Perry and with Dan. Uh, you have the CFTC, who is the key regulating body of derivatives in the United States. You have CME is the biggest um, financial market infrastructure provider in the world. Um, and um, and sort of that's probably just a, sort of a selected overview on, about this. Um, CCPs, we're gonna have uh, an introduction by Ceci, so I'm not gonna say much. Um, maybe I should not say anything, but that um, because the, the regulators, the G20 regulators have made it a uh, mandate to make this a sort of a mitigating factor for uh, uh, you know, making sure that there's not a next financial um, uh, financial crisis, um, the regulation isn't yet settled. And so this is the problem and this is the huge opportunity for those of us who are interested in doing research on, on areas that actually require real thinking and real answers, like current problems that matter. And if you think of it as, you know, the 1860s having provided by budget, there's, you know, central banks should go deal with a um, collapsing bank and lend freely at high collateral, high interest against good collateral. We don't have that yet for a CCP. And um, regulation is often started with, um, is starting with uh, banks and CCPs are not a bank. And I'm sure we'll get to know about this uh, in a minute. Uh, but just know that CCPs, everybody around the world has accepted that CCPs are systemically important. And so um, just to add to this matters. I think um, this presentation is available um, um, at YSI. Uh, just approach us if you, have, uh, if you wanna have that presentation and you just haven't found it yet. There's a Dropbox with lots of material um, if you wanna have access to this or to any of the slides that are being um, shown today. Um, just sent, uh, just sent me a message um, and through the system. And with that, I would say um, I'll hand it over to Ceci and we can do Q&A um, at the end. So over to you, Ceci. Okay, uh, many thanks people and many thanks everyone for joining this session. Um, I'm sorry, my um, audio makes some kind of weird up and downs, but I hope this um, stays okay in any case. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Yep, I can see it. Okay, I'm full screen mode now. Okay, yeah, so as Kiko mentioned, this is a very um, high level introduction on, on the question of, uh, of central counterparty clearing and what they are. And of course, since this has been part of the our ongoing conversation. You can also um, check perhaps much more uh, into details, um, either, the, either the material or also the, the webinars that have already been posted, but we can recap this at the very end. So just uh, a quick overview of what we are going to talk about. First of all, well, what's, a sta uh, what's at stake? And uh, in this case, as we have many people from the Financial Stability Working Group, I guess you might be quite familiar with the, with the financial stability question underlying um, CCPs. Then just uh, some brief definition of what CCPs are and also how we understand them as part of the as financial market infrastructures. 
Then uh, we're going to um, see which are the key mechanisms um, that actually CCPs um, put into practice in order to, uh, to manage counterparty, uh, counterparty risks and why or whether they should be um, superior to, um, to non-centralized um, clearing. Then we will also go to some uh, design issues that are important to, to consider from this more normative perspective if we, if we want. Uh, then we will recap with some of the benefits of CCPs. And then, yeah, just uh, as a final, just some final words on, on this um, ongoing uh, research effort. Um, so yeah, this is just to, um, yeah, to put us a bit in, in, into context. So um, essentially, um, apart from what Kiko already mentioned in connection to the, the post financial crisis uh, mandate from the, in the G20 and so on, uh, the question of um, of CCPs is still pretty much um, yeah you can see it pretty much in in the news. Well, I have taken some of the FT's recent um, um, headings on the topic, but of course this is something that you might also come up with um, in your research or in any other um, yeah source of information that you might get. Uh, for instance, the question of uh, of Brexit and um, and the CCPs that are actually in the UK, which have introduced a lot of, uh, apart from the te technical aspects and the technical difficulties of CCP design and so on, there are a lot of uh, political and political economy uh, issues and so on. So this makes it a bit more uh, of an interesting thing to, to see. But what we know is that essentially um, uh, it's important to keep on this channel with, uh, with the CCPs based in London in spite of the, uh, of the Brexit transition or whatever the, the final arrangement is. Uh, we have also this um, interesting quote from, uh, from Paul Tucker, which you might um, know. And he, he points out in this kind of very uh, recent um, um, FT article that um, these are actually uh, at the very center of, um, of the financial system and they uh, CCPs, uh, really have a, a very clear and a very central um, function. So just to give a quick um, definition, I am moving this is here. This is a very, um, very basic uh, yeah, graphic information, where it essentially the CCP is um, this clearing house that, it's, uh, that interposes itself or that goes in between um, these counterparties to the, the contact, uh, to the contracts that are traded. And this process is called um, novation, which is actually some sort of uh, legal contractual term, in meaning that the obligations that existed before are somehow transformed into these new um, obligations. Uh, then we will see a little bit of a modified version of this, of this first um, drawing that we have here. And then, yeah, essentially a way to also understand these pieces to to see them as um, critical financial market infrastructures that can actually um, reduce, and as we see here, uh, neutralize this counterparty credit risk um, in the markets where they operate. And we mention this because there are different um, contracts and different markets in which CCPs can actually um, operate. But the important thing here to see is that um, CCPs are what we consider financial market infrastructure and therefore differ from other types of, um, of intermediaries that we know. And here we have this more uh, concrete definition of CCPs as financial market infrastructures. Uh, and this relates to, to one of the key papers that we, yeah, that uh, in the project we have um, all or almost all read this question of a CCP is a CCP, which tends to um, explain that CCPs differ from, uh, from other types of intermediaries such as banks, and that therefore the, the conceptual and intellectual tools that we need in order to understand or, or the governance uh, mechanisms that we applied for specific institutions are not necessarily the ones that should be um, considered for, uh, for financial market infrastructures because they perform um, a different role and they, um, and they actually have this, um, this very 
unique function of being the, the plumbing uh, of the financial system. And therefore, this is one of the key points of their um, critical uh, functions. So just uh, moving a little bit more after having seen what we are talking about, um, I'm going to describe uh, very quickly which are um, the mechanisms that actually um, CCP is deployed in order to, um, to manage counterparty credit risk. And in this regard, I will be, yeah, and what we're going to see now, the first one, which is uh, called multi uh, multilateral netting. Then we will uh, briefly mention um, what the variation margin is. And then finally, um, we will briefly mention the default um, waterfall. And again, this all relates to these mechanisms that in theory should be superior or should be better equipped than uh, non-centrally um, cleared um, markets. So the first one we have here, um, an example that was taken from, um, from uh, an article from uh, the Bank of England, where you can see here what we refer by this multilateral netting. Um, it's essentially trying to aggregate what the different parties uh, owe to each other and in, in this way simplify the, um, the internal uh, exposures in this gross way. And therefore you can see how, for instance, from the first picture to the second and to the third, how this actually operates, which is aimed to actually make the system more efficient from this um, aggregated perspective. Whoops. Then the second uh, broad mechanism um, used by, by CCPs uh, relates to this uh, variation margin, um, which has um, a collateral function sort of say, but in this case, um, we, we see that CCPs impose this kind of um, daily uh, strict and, and high quality margin requirements on the members, which at the same time, this, um, this question of the variation margin relates to, um, to another design issue that we will uh, be discussing afterwards that relates to the, to the members that are accepted uh, as part of the CCPs. Um, so therefore you see that this, um, this is actually a key, um, a key mechanism and a key feature from, from CCPs in order to, to actually uh, mitigate um, this kind of counterparty risks. And then perhaps one of the, yeah, one of the, also the, the most um, visible benefits from CCPs relate to this question of the default waterfall, which um, refers um, simply to the fact that, which is the order through which um, we will take the, the financial resources from the, the general pool. And here again, it's all related to essentially who pays the bill and how the losses would be um, um, yeah, diversified between the CCPs and the non-defaulting members. So essentially this is one of the, the key aspects that, um, that actually makes uh, yeah, CCPs uh, preferable or, or this is why actually the, centrally, uh, the central clearing is um, a sort of key feature of, the, um, of this plumbing system. And as we uh, have seen in the, first, uh, in the first picture with the definition where, um, yeah, when I mentioned the question of the novation and the, and the CCPs in between the parties, actually, um, apart from this kind of mediation between the parties, uh, a key question here is that actually, yeah, CCPs are not like magic entities, of course, but um, all these mechanisms that have been um, mentioned so far depend to some extent, depend on, on a large extent on this uh, question of balance sheet design and how actually um, these things are actually engineered in order to, um, to, all to allocate losses and to, um, yeah, and to actually make this um, these mechanisms that were previously mentioned uh, possible. Now, um, just before moving to the, yeah, to the, to the benefits, 
Um, I will go through these um, design issues that, of course, um, these are four broad things that actually have uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of uh, research behind and much more to, to be done as well, because actually uh, um, last week in our webinar with uh, Professor Dan Ori, we had many, um, many questions actually stemming from, from these design issues that are actually unsolved. So all these that I'm presenting here um, contains a lot of uh, open questions and, and question marks that um, of course would benefit from, yeah, from our uh, thinking and, and for the research. But essentially the, um, the key point in question is that if um, CCPs are meant to be um, better at actually absorbing and managing counterparty credit, credit risk, um, we need to consider some of these um, aspects in order to see how um, how to actually structure or um, yeah how to make these mechanisms work. So one of the things um, one of the key things is actually um, the question of the member access, right? That was also related to to some of the mechanisms mentioned before. And we have here, for example, um, the question of balancing whether we need too many members, which would actually make this uh, pool of resources better or too few, which could also lead to some um, other complications. And again, on these, um, the official documents also point to this kind of uh, balancing between um, yeah, having a good number of members, but at the same time, um, trying to, yeah, to balance this, uh, these two aspects. So of course, it's not really, uh, yeah, it's, this is something not, not written in stone. Then the second uh, aspect that concerns um, the design of CCPs relate to which contracts or which range of contracts actually should be cleared, which of course depend on, on many specific um, yeah, technical characteristics of, uh, of each of the contracts that are or should be cleared. Then third, uh, an important question relates to, um, to risk allocation, which is actually um, essentially how, uh, how these risk losses are to be um, split and, and distributed, which is also related to what we have um, seen before on the default waterfall. And then um, a fourth, but yeah, Nevertheless, crucial aspect relates to um, ownership and governance of CCPs. And here we have the two main um, options or alternatives between a mutual or a shareholder ownership. So essentially a mutual um, ownership refers to when the, the clearing members are also the owners of the CCP, whereas the shareholder ownership refers to those cases where well, the CCP is owned by external parties. And of course, this creates a series of questions in relation to uh, which are the incentives in, in one or the other case. Um, as you can see, all these design issues are quite interconnected among each other. So just to, um, to recap, so essentially from these uh, risk, management, risk management mechanisms that were pointed out before, there are two broad um, benefits from CCPs that emerge. And one relates to, um, to the question of efficiency, which is related to, the, um, to one of the mechanisms when, when we mentioned the question of netting and actually offsetting positions in a more actually efficient way uh, in comparison to non-centrally cleared um, contracts. And then the second one relates to uh, actually uh, risk management which again relates to this more, uh, apart from the, the technical question in itself, it also relates to, uh, to the normative claim of saying, okay, who's a better risk uh, manage, manager actually, either centralized or non-centralized um, market. So now just to share one final um, thought, I mean, this has been a very, broad and, and high level uh, introduction, but nevertheless, as you might have seen, um, there is a lot of room for um, further research and also most importantly, and actually in light of uh, 
or in line with, um, with the whole plenary and also um, YSI in general. Uh, there is a lot of room for multidisciplinary research because as you have, or you might have seen, this very same topic can be addressed by, by many different um, perspectives and also disciplines. And actually, well, in my case, uh, I have a legal background. Christophe has a completely different uh, background in mathematics. So you see that it's possible to have some uh, dialogues and some um, common research interest in, in spite of your different uh, points of view. And yeah, just again to recap what Kiko mentioned, we have, um, we have had in the past and we have uh, upcoming uh, webinars, materials and senior scholars that are actually working on projects on more advanced questions, um, always in this regard. But again, you're all invited to actually have a look and, and yeah, take it from, from your discipline and your background. So yeah, this is it from my side. I can be the middle person. So thank you, Ceci, handing it over to you, Christoph. Okay, uh, so I shall immediately continue with my presentation. Yes, um, okay. in the interest of time. And so then yeah. we can have a combined Q&A at the end. Good, that's fine. Good, so let me share my screen with you. Okay, so a very short introduction to the money view. Um, so first of all, the big question actually is what happens to the financial system if we introduce one large CCP in the middle. So what happens to the system if we move from the picture on the left to the picture on the right? Um, CCPs are special. We've just heard about that. Um, one issue is, for example, that a CCP maximizes not return, but collateral for a given risk. And that's a big difference, for example, to a bank. And the safety that is desired by CCPs brings about problems or externalities for its clients. Um, basically, you can say that counterparty credit risk of the clients is transformed into liquidity risk uh, for the clients of the CCP. Um, and these clients are, for example, dealer banks. So you see there is liquidity risk, uh, dealer banks, um, closely connected to liquidity risk is our repo markets. And all these issues are at the heart of the money view theory. And therefore we hope that the money view will be helpful to understand CCPs better. Okay, so um, principles of the money view, at least as I see it. Um, here are important aspects. First, radical uncertainty and Minsky's survival constraint. Um, I'll talk about this in a second in greater detail. Then we strictly think in balance sheets. Uh, you are a balance sheet. The kindergarten next door is a balance sheet. Everything is a balance sheet with cash in and outflows. Then um, we emphasize the strict hierarchical structure of the financial system, the strict hierarchy of money and credit. And then the different layers of the hierarchy are connected by the dealers. And uh, therefore dealers are key institutions in the financial system. They are at the heart of everything. So let me briefly discuss these uh, principles in greater detail. So radical uncertainty certainty simply means there are things we don't know that we don't know. So um, more practically speaking, we cannot uh, do the usual exercise to optimize consumption um, uh, between different periods and optimize labor and consumption with debt as a buffer, the usual things that you normally do because you simply don't know the right probability distributions. Um, in the money view, debt is very simply just a promise to pay in the future in exchange for higher consumption or investment today. It's as simple as that. And it's a free system. Uh, you can load up debt as you like in the first place yeah, for certain investments. And then there is Minsky's survival constraint, which tests your plan in the future. You have to pay your interest. You, you have to make your interest payment or you go bankrupt. And um, 
And the payment system is very important here because the payment system uh, can provide more elasticity to the debtor, can be more lenient, or it can put more discipline on the debtor. So the payment system is very important in the money view. And if the payment system is lenient to you, then you will borrow money in the money market uh, to postpone your payment. And the money market rates tell you whether there is payment stress in, in the whole financial system. So collective payment stress. That's the whole idea. Um, thinking in balance sheets. So I've just mentioned it. Everybody is a balance sheet. Everybody has cash in and outflows and must make ends meet. Uh, what you see here is at least in my opinion, the most important set of balance sheets in the whole money view theory. You see here how the balance sheet of a bank is broken up into a whole set of different balance sheets, the money market fund, the dealer, the hedge fund. And this constitutes the market-based credit system or the shadow banking system. Use the term that you like. And uh, you can make many different analysis based on these, uh, this set of balance sheets. It's actually the set of balance sheets that I always carry with me in, in my head when I read the Financial Times. Um, so a practitioner like Zoltan Pujar, for example, would ask um, about the size of the, of the balance sheet, the size of the flows between the balance sheets and how they change over time and what does it all mean? That's a question for a practitioner. And academics like Perry Merling would say, well, what balance sheet is the most important one that we see here? So it's a more analytic, uh, he looks at it more analytically. And he would emphasize that the dealer balance sheet is the key balance sheet here. And he would have a look at the economics of the dealer function. Okay, so. We have just talked about dealers. So what does the balance sheet of a dealer look like? Here you see a dealer in more or less any asset class that you like, bonds, FX, commodities, equities, what have you. What a dealer needs to make markets is he needs an inventory of cash and the specific asset, say bonds, for example. Um, the dealer business is highly leveraged. So he will uh, borrow the money that he needs for the two inventories. So on the right hand side, you see different kinds of credit and it's usually short term credit, secured short term or unsecured short term credit. And um, just as a byproduct, as a side product of the actual business of the dealer, um, he creates different kinds of money for institutional investors because they will prefer, for example, secure short-term credit over a deposit at a bank, for example. And uh, the different forms of short-term credit, secured, unsecured, whatever you like, short-term, long-term, uh, secured with treasury, secured with private bonds, um, these different kinds of credit already create a hierarchy of money uh, and also credit for institutional investors. Good, here is the hierarchy of money and credit in its simplest form, I, I guess. So at the top of the hierarchy, you see cash or reserves. Then there are deposits from banks, which are a promise to pay cash. Uh, and then we have different kinds of credit. So triple A is very good credit. Triple B is, um, well, investment grade credit. It's still okay credit. And uh, these bonds are promises to pay deposits. So you already see, um, this is what the, this graph suggests, that there's much more credits and deposits and much, much more deposits than cash. This is right. And in the boom, differences between the different layers of the hierarchy are blurred. Um, it doesn't matter whether you own a bond or a deposit, you can sell the bond anyway, and it's easy. And in a crisis, this hierarchy is reasserted. Uh, this is a bond. This is a deposit and with a deposit you can make a payment and with a bond you cannot make a payment as simple as that okay um the role of the dealers they connect the different layers in the hierarchy for example the dealer between cash and deposits is the money dealer also known as a bank or a bond dealer uh, connect the layers between the triple a bonds for example and triple b bonds and deposits and the big question is whether $100 in cash, so the best quality, 
the highest uh, layer in the hierarchy and 100 US dollar in deposits actually make 200 US dollar. This only works if the money dealer, if the bank is fine. But in a crisis, this equality may break down. And that's the big point. Okay, uh, what we see here is at least as I see it, the analytical heart of the whole money view. Um, it's from a paper by Jack Trainer from 1987, and he wondered how market prices are actually made by dealer banks or by dealers. Um, you see on the x-axis uh, the position of the dealer, so the risk position of the dealer, say the size of his inventory, as simple as that. And uh, on the y-axis you see the price, and you see bid price and ask price, these are the two dashed lines here with an inside spread for the dealer to actually make money from buying and selling. Now, when many people come and sell bonds, for example, sell bonds to the dealer, uh, his inventory will grow and his risk position, his risk exposure will grow. So we're moving here to the right and the dealer will lower the price, both bid and ask, to discourage more investors to come and sell the same bond to him. And at a certain point, um, the dealer says, it's enough. My uh, balance sheet has grown too large and I cannot increase my, my inventory anymore. And in this at this point, he needs someone out there in the financial system uh, where he can offload his excess inventory. And uh, Jack Trainer imagines that these are, this group of investors are the value traders. And uh, for a certain very low price, they are happy to buy any amount of the bond from the dealer. And this is uh, more or less, the, well, this is, they come to the rescue of the dealer at this, in this situation. Okay, and uh, just in the other direction, at the dealer's maximum short position, value traders are happy to sell the bond to the dealer at, at any quantity to help reduce his uh, short position. Good. Um, today, it's not so much a value trader, I think, but the central bank, which comes to the rescue of the dealer. Uh, and the market prices are uh, made uh, between the value-based ask and the value-based bid price. This is actually called the outside spread here. It's not observable, of course, it's just in theory. Um, but you see market prices fluctuate between these two limits. Okay, this is just a set of little notes for me to remember whether I've told you everything. Um, yeah, maybe the last point is worth mentioning. So what happens here is that dealers set prices, they quote bid and ask prices in the morning, and then they absorb the resulting trading flow and adapt their bid and ask prices. And that's more or less it. And uh, therefore, it's uh, important and very interesting, particularly in a crisis, to uh, have a look at uh, the, the, the behavior of the, of the dealer balance sheets, because you can see um, a lot about the nature of the crisis uh, when you see what happens on the balance sheet of the dealers. OK, so that's the money view at least as I see it. And maybe this all sounds very natural to you. What's the big fuss about it? And uh, to make this point clear, let's have a look at a little application. And then you will see why a mainstream economist say uh, will have his problems with the money view. So let's have a look at the question, why do prices actually change? Why do prices fluctuate? So first of all, the finance view. The finance view is all about time varying expected returns, time varying risk aversion. Uh, so the price is discounted expected cash flows. And a change in the price is just because of either a change in expected cash flows, that's the view of the 1970s, or a change in the expected risk and change in the discount rate. That's the view of the 1990s until today. Uh, the money view uh, is very different. Uh, prices fluctuate because dealers absorb the trading flow and adapt their bid, bid and ask prices. And uh, dealers change their prices if the size of the inventory changes, if their funding conditions for this inventory changes, or if their overall risk appetite changes for some reason. And that's it. 
Um, let's have a, have a look at a very concrete example. In 2008, financial uh, price, market prices crashed. And two years later, in 2010, um, Eugene Farmer was asked what he thinks about this crash in market prices of 2008. And he says this, stock prices typically decline prior to and in a state of recession. This, and he mean, means the crisis of 2008, was a particularly severe recession and prices started to decline in advance of when people recognized that it was a recession and then continued to decline. There was nothing unusual about that. That is exactly what you would expect if markets were efficient. So basically what Eugene Farmer says here is that in 2008, prices dropped because the market correctly <laughs> realizes that a recession is about to come. Prices fall today because the market realizes ahead of anybody else that a, uh, that a recession is coming. It's just a matter of information processing and nothing else. Uh, the money view is very different about this and very specific. In 2008, prices drop because the dealer system collapses. As simple as that. And now I ask you, what do you find more helpful and what sounds more natural to you as an explanation? I must admit, the more I think about this interpretation, in 2008, prices drop because the market realizes a recession is coming, the more I come to believe that someone must have thought pretty hard about asset pricing and somewhere on the road get lost in his own brain in his own brain convolutions and uh, maybe the money view is the way out i thank you for your attention excellent christoph um thank you to both of you ceci and christoph to take time out of um your work um your practitioner and academic life um, to present this today. I am sort of leaning to maybe just talk another one or two uh, non-needing sentences to give everybody a chance to think about whether you have questions or not. Um, and I would suggest to either put your name. Oh shit, are you still there? Yes. I thought for a moment I was gone. Huh. Um, to just put your name in in the in the uh, in the chat box, and um, and if you have no questions, that's also fine. Um, as you are, um, so let's see if there are there any questions. To uh, let's say to Christoph about the money view, to Ceci about CCPs, uh, to myself about uh, the, the liquidity project. Um, I mean, maybe one thing about the liquidity project. So um, we had been founded around um, on, a, on a conference by uh, Katerina Pastor, um, uh, I mean, Professor uh, Pastor, Professor Har, uh, Brigitte, so Katarina Pistor, Brigitte Haar, and Dan Ori, um, end of 2015 in Frankfurt. And um, there was like 25 young scholars of ours. And one of the participants was um, Robert Steigerwald from the Chicago Fed, who, who will be also um, speaking um, next to Dan on November 10. And so this focus is a lot on CCPs because of the reasons that we talked about. And, um, and so I just wanted to make sense of why we put this together. So um, um, Perry Merling and Robert Steigerwald have sort of teamed up or have, uh, have put out their intent to um, write a paper together. And that's sort of, uh, if you wanna have more information around that, there are some uh, video webinars, some um, minutes on this. That's something that if you wanna be sort of in the, not in a driving seat, but sort of around that, um, these, uh, one theorist and one practitioner coming together and writing something that is maybe just another thing. And this introduction is maybe a good starting point for anybody who wants to do this, um, CCP and Money View together. So Hector is um, the first one here with a, is, a, is someone with a question here. I'm going to read it out, Ceci, or do you want to read it out? 
So um, does the waterfall structure for the absorption of losses look similar for any CCP? Okay. For you, uh, Ceci. Um, I don't know, Kiko, if you have any comments on this since you're more... Uh, in this, yeah. So the waterfall is something that has been around for forever, I guess. Um, so the first CC, so the answer is uh, the principle of that is pretty much anywhere I can think of. Yes, this is something you would see sort of with a 99% confidence uh, for, for all CCPs. So CCPs, I guess the first one that you, that is definitely we know about is in Le Havre, France, I think in the 18, somewhere between the 1860s and 90s, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, there's been a lot of CCP um, development happening in Europe, but there's a lot of CCP developing most lately in, in the United States, specifically in Chicago. And, uh, but the print, so it's, there's a, there's a difference, but the idea is that members come together, right? These banks come together and they make a sort of an, an back office institution. And, and they had, but they always had this idea of, um, we put in some money and then the first hit is gonna come um, from that default uh, mechanism. And so actually maybe one thing to just mention on the waterfall is that there is in principle two, two parts of the waterfall. So the, of a default mechanism, one is the first one is structured as Sissy put out on the page with the different layers of a waterfall. And then there is, if it's worse than that. So if the, the default is bigger than the um, sort of the insurance that's been put out through the waterfall, then there is also rules set out what happens. Uh, well, well, there's a toolbox that's been defined what happens once you go through the waterfall? And there's been a, I think, fascinating webinar between um, Sunil Katino, who is the president of CME Clearing, and actually Basil Sansom and myself. Basil is gonna do, uh, he's a very advanced thinker in this. He's gonna do also, he's gonna present during the research uh, session. But there's an interesting uh, discussion on two uh, CCP stress cases. There's been in the 1987, a Hong Kong, um, uh, stress case. It was saved, but it burned through the waterfall. And in 1989, there has been in New Zealand um, um, a, a failure. And so these are there's case studies on that, and that and sort of that addresses that. I don't know, Hector, if I I've I've said so much. I'm hoping I've I've really addressed some of your question. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, it's um it's great what you mentioned, but I don't know if the question also related to the. Um, the type of, I don't know, regulatory requirements in different, uh, I don't know, between the US and Europe, but I would- uh, The guess, details of it. Yeah, but I would, yeah. But I oh, would that's say, always different. Yeah, that could be, that, that's different. Yeah, sorry. Cases, Every CCP has a different. But there's like a somehow hierarchy in the difference in between the different things that go through the, that is for waterfall. It's a bit like the, I don't know the different back, bankrupts, bankruptcy um, regimes. Uh, if you think of it, I don't know across Europe, but in any case, you can always see some kind of uh, hierarchy between the different instruments. Even if in the legal details part might be not necessarily exactly the same. This is why there are different regimes, but there is a similar structure. Yeah, sorry. Then I was maybe just rambling on, uh, Hector, on this one. So um, every CCP has a different, like the intricacies of every waterfall is different at every CCP, but that's publicly available knowledge. And uh, the key elements are the ones that Ceci had put out on the presentation. And then, then you might have some splits in there. And like, for example, the equity of the CCP is sometimes split at two different uh, order of the waterfall. But that's something that that can be assessed for every individual CCP. The the major levers of them I, are all the same for every CCP. I would say with a ninety nine percent confidence. So um, Hector, let let us know if that was okay or if you need some extra on that. So Adam, I think you're next on a, on a comment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, it's Adam speaking, uh, and. Um, uh, I just would like to uh, tell you that uh, this is a comment, <laughs> not uh, just focusing on uh, the topic. And I'm really grateful 
uh, for Kiko and uh, Ceci and Christophe for uh, attending this session and uh, talk about their uh, projects and researches. And it, it was very, really inspiring for me. Uh, actually, the, the, what I would like to talk about that the, the main task of this YSI plenary is uh, to collaboratively formulate uh, the most uh, pertinent research questions for YSI uh, to address in the future. And I think that uh, the money view, uh, also the uh, liquidity project, uh, is, is, is the center currently of the uh, YSI uh, research agendas. But um, <clears throat> uh, the main task uh, for us, I mean, for both the participants and the, the, the speakers, uh, is uh, this uh, Q&A session is not, not just uh, answer and ask questions, Instead, uh, the, the main purpose of this YSI plenary is to contribute uh, in finding uh, the most exciting uh, uh, research questions for YSI, which uh, YSI and this community should address and uh, to guide uh, in the direction of the future collaborative research and the research work and also maybe some projects. And uh, my comment was that, and maybe if you could uh, kindly uh, just share your thoughts about it, I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So Alan, do you want us to now, or is it during the plenary when it comes later, when the, in the question fair that we should share our thoughts? Maybe, maybe you can uh, just uh, share your thoughts about it now, but uh, sure, uh, in the, the following 10 days, uh, you are open to, to so I'm not sure if that's answering the question. And I know, Ceci or Christoph, do you want to take this or? Yeah, I mean, I can briefly, I mean, okay. I think that uh, developing um, good research questions, it's uh, not easy. Uh, probably yeah, those who have uh, struggled, I mean, with uh, their master's thesis and PhD knows, I mean, know that it's not really a uh, straightforward uh, process actually so I think this is much uh, I really welcome this uh, initiative and I think that yeah at least um, I don't know for those that are that really have an interest in, in this I think that in the in our last uh, webinar actually less than a week ago and last Wednesday um, we actually formulated a lot of uh, questions but more open questions with Professor Danori in the, um, when we were delving into uh, more specific questions on CCP. So uh, far from being, um, yeah, uh, I don't know, a session full of answers. I think it was full of uh, debate and, um, and also the opportunity for uh, collaboration, which I think it's, uh, it's good. And it's also uh, a key component in my view of this type of networking and platforms also get to know each other and get to know uh, whether there is any possibility for collaboration or common research interests. So I think this is uh, a great initiative from the plenary side. Okay, I'm not sure I got the question correctly. So the question is how the money view can help us find good research questions in the field of CCPs, right? Yes, and I, I would assume also maybe you have some uh, maybe you have a direction of questions um, because I think this uh, this plenary is going to be about at the end writing down either specific questions or sort of directionally what could be questions. Okay. So, but it's yes. Yeah. Well, for me there is one very specific question, basically. Yeah. Well, I'm I do empirical analysis and statistics or econometrics, if you like. Um, so I, uh, my question is, uh, the money view, tell, Perry Merling tells me, look at the dealer system. Dealers are key. So my question is, what does CCP do, or the introduction of CCPs do to the dealer system? As simple as that. How does the balance sheet of dealer banks change because uh, CCPs are around all of a sudden? And uh, for the US dealer banks, um, there is at least good data available. So at the Fed, you get weekly data. That's that's good. For Europe, it's much, much more difficult. And I wonder where I can get a good data set or get my hands on a good data set without spending a few weeks struggling to collect it all on my own because uh, Eurostat is really a mess, at least I think so. Um, well, yes, that's basically it. What does CCP do to the dealer system? That's question number one. 
And uh, at the moment, uh, there is only number one for me due to time limits. Yeah, that's it. I think that's great. I'm um, Adam. Thanks for this, this um, for for pushing, uh, um, unlocking this uh, this conversation. So I think that um, if you were to look, for example, we had this. Uh, Ceci was talking. So Krista was giving, I think, a very specific answer, Adam, to your question, and Ceci was pointing to a conversation with Dan Ori where we had put out some questions. Um, and Ceci, correct me if I'm wrong, but this could be like, what's the role of competition? What should we, how should competition, what role should competition play at CCPs to achieve um, a better a better market structure? Um, and, and, and maybe a few others. Um, governance is a huge topic right now. If you look at the Financial Times, some of the Financial Times headlines that Ceci had on her first or second page in the presentation. There's a huge fight going on right now within the Financial Times being in the public between the so-called buy side and sell side, sort of the basically the clearing members who are members at these clearing institutions and the clearing house itself. And the regulator, it seems to me, is sort of on the, on the clearing house side. And, and there is this fight going on. And there's this fight is ultimately around governance. Um, I think clearing members feel that they uh, don't have enough say, uh, but they're ultimately there to pay the bill. On the other side, they're there to benefit. And I'm not gonna go into it, but there's a lot of people who wanna go into it. This is, um, this is Adam, one question that, that uh, requires a focus um, and it has to do with liquidity in the end, um, I guess as well, who's gonna, who's gonna how can it how can this systemic risk come up and who's then therefore up on the hook for this we are going to have for those of us interested in economic development um, a researcher from the world bank on who's going to talk about the role of ccps in developing countries and so we haven't had this conversation yet but i would be looking for someone who's interested with this background maybe to a webinar tomorrow um, as such so there is a whole range um, of, of questions. And I hope that was sort of um, a answer. Or, or maybe just because I see also Farad in there. So um, Robert uh, from now the ECB, Hofmeister, uh, we only had a starting point, but we really wanted to get with him liquidity problems in the payment system now. Um, and how that was in the beginning uh, being solved by CLS. CLS is... Uh, sort of a, a clearinghouse light um, system that they put up and we didn't quite make it to the innovative of blockchain yet um, but there certainly would be um, there would be uh, another area that we would be looking at I don't, I don't know that's probably the best we can do Miriam you want to take the mic and hi by the way Hello, hi, good to see you all. Good to see you, Cecilia and Adam and Kiko. It's been a while. <laughs> um, actually, I have two questions. Um, yep. The first question is related with Christoph said. Um, I want one clarification about he, one slide that he included oh, externality. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Externality. So I just want to uh, do the clarification about the relation of liquidity risk, money view, and externality and dealer. Uh, yeah. Is like externality, positive externality, negative externality, or I, I think I don't get it, everything that uh, you said in that slide. Does this, does the clarification. And uh, my second question is for Kiko. It related the past discussions, uh, I saw there are many interesting um, sessions and discussions. I think I know the answer, but I want to uh, know your um, your idea about this. But uh, do you record the last the last um, sessions? They are in Young Scholar Directory. We can see that. This is my question. So thank you and good to see you all. Good to see you. Okay, um, so as I understand it, CCPs are so safe. They're actually private institutions, but of course too big to fail. And uh, they get this, they gain their safety from requiring initial margins uh, from their clients. And initial margins are liquid assets. 
And uh, in effect, um, the clients of the CCPs are dealer banks, and they must pledge part of, the, part of their liquid assets as initial margins. So CCPs, on the one hand, get safer, and dealer banks get a higher liquidity risk exposure because part of their liquid assets is gone for them. It's pledged. And uh, this is the, the externality. Yeah? CCPs gain the safety from offloading liquidity risk onto their clients. Yeah, that's all I can say. <laughs> um, hi, Miriam. Um, so, you might be asking this question because you might might have had trouble accessing some of the recordings, and I think that um, um, Martin, um, like the the people who are um, coding our Wise I page, I think they're working on this. But all the all the webinars in the past, um, including one between um, uh, Celine Chang and Andrew Medeiros, for example, who had done a webinar with Robert Steigerwald and and, and many others, they're all um, recorded. And um, but they might not be accessible right now, but it's going to be hopefully only days when they're going to be accessible again. And this PDF that I showed shows link. And if either these are going to work again or there's going to be an update, so we will provide an update um, on an overview of all these webinars once this technical question has been solved and addressed. And and this one is recorded as well. So. Farad, um, do you want to um, take the mic or should I, I can I, I ask you, blockchain contract potentially play a role in CCP systems. So, um, so blockchain could be a disruptor to CCPs. Um, a CCP is central and blockchain is decentral. And the question is if um, blockchain can therefore disrupt CCPs. And I think a lot of people are thinking of that way and a lot of people are working on this. In a way, maybe that's already happening. The, th the thing is that we are mostly, or CCPs, how they become interesting right now, or since 2009, since the G20 um, meeting in Pittsburgh, we're talking mostly CCPs derivative contracts. And there is a, a, a difference between using a CCP for derivatives contracts and instead of using a CCP for cash markets, like an equity or bond. That is because in derivatives markets, when you go into a contract, that contract, let's say a derivatives market uh, contract is for, let's say five years, that contract stays for five years in a clearinghouse. Uh, when there is an equity transaction, this is gonna be maybe only one or two or three days. And so a clearinghouse was only gonna be busy for that time. So I think blockchain, whatever it's gonna do, it's probably not gonna do the five year, the derivatives, contract so that's sort of a short-term outlook i would put out um and so um, it plays a role in this liquidity project because there are liquidity questions that are addressed um let's say in the payment system but when it comes to ccps and i think that was your question and and where mostly the focus is right now i think it's probably not so uh, an issue this here the bio has put out Ceci, you have put out, this is a link to the latest recording, the session with uh, Professor Ore. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Good. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, no, just to, to say that it, it's working, the recordings. Okay, okay, great. Yes, okay, that was the one that we had yesterday. Um, the ones that I said were not working were the ones of, um, sort of months before, like the sort of before March or something because the links are not working. Good, um, since, um, since uh, this was now a long time for giving everyone a chance to put their name in, I'm just looking at Ceci and Christoph. Um, is there anything else um, from your perspective you wanted to say? Mm. Yes, um, why should I ask this? Um, I watched the MOOC, you watched the MOOC. Um, did I miss an important idea from the money view? <laughs> Um, so you, do you want to have that on the, okay. Um, I don't know, but I think that, I think your presentations are just amazing and, uh, and that, uh, we, we should maybe do this outside the recording now. <laughs> um, I, you know what, I'll do this outside the recording, but maybe someone else though wants to give feedback. 
Well, hold on. Maybe actually someone wants to do this also outside the recording. We can do this in a minute. Ceci, that's the only thing you want to say, right? Yeah, yeah. Feedback on, yeah. on the, okay. Ceci, no, not so much feedback, but maybe. Um, or missing I anything, like yeah. Move, yeah, is there something missing? Do you think so, yeah? Okay. Um, Ceci? Anything we missed? Mm. Adam? No? Good. Then I uh, thank everybody, and um, we're going to stop the recording now.